This morning's reading is read from Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I'll give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Amen. Remembrance Sunday has become part of our tradition, an important tradition, but a tradition nevertheless. And I say that because how many people really do appreciate the work of our armed forces? And how many people truly understand the effects that war and conflicts have on the lives of those who are at the very centre of it all? The pictures relayed to our television screens and the editorials placed in our papers, as traumatic and overwhelming as they can be, they never really capture the reality of the situation, a reality which only experience can bring. Like many, I sat and watched the Remembrance Festival yesterday evening as I have for many, many years. And although part of its format has changed, the meaning has remained the same. As you watch those in the forces proudly coming down the steps in the Albert Hall, some, some showing the medals that they have gained. We have the Chelsea pensioners who continue to share in the occasion despite their age and ability. And then the mothers, the children, and the widows who represent the hundreds who have lost their loved ones over the past years. For all of them, it may be a moment of pride, but also a moment of sadness. Personally, I know very little about war, something that I'm very grateful for. But I did get a glimpse of what it was like a few years ago when I worked part-time in a residential home in Devonport in Plymouth. One of the residents there was a very pleasant, unassuming man who had a heart of gold. Many a time he would talk about his beloved wife who had died many years before and whose picture was never far from his bedside. Frank often shared in, of the joy that he felt knowing that she would be waiting for him when he returned from abroad when he served in the army. Frank often spoke about the pleasant side of war experiences, like the time he met the Queen Mother, who he admired and adored, 
and woe betide anyone who said anything about her to the contrary. Or there was the time when coming home from yet another assignment, the forces were met on Plymouth Station by Lady Astor, a memory that Frank was always pleased to recount and something that was appreciated from what he said by all those who had experienced it at the time. Yet one day, after I left working in the home, I went back to see him. In the course of conversation, he began again to recall about the Lady Astor event. I took the opportunity of asking him what it was like for him serving in, for his country. It was then that I began to understand more clearly, perhaps for the very first time, what those who fight for our good and the good of others really go through. Frank spoke about many things on, the, on that occasion, but there are two instances that really struck me and has never left me. The first, I think, was in Korea, and he recalled how in the front line there were hundreds of young men, about 17, 18 years of old, all eager, but all inexperienced. They didn't stand a chance, he said. They were ill-equipped and they didn't really have a clue. They should never have been there. You knew, he said, that the minute the order was given to advance, that most would never be going home alive. And there was nothing that we who were older could do about it. What a waste of young lives. Then there was the time when he and his comrades were sent into a church and there strewn over the floor were bodies of young women and children. The women had been raped, hung, beaten and left to die along with their children. It was awful, he said. Awful. I have never forgotten the sight before my eyes or the smell that met us before we even entered the building. It made your blood boil to think that these innocent people had been through. And it also made you think about your own family back home and how you would feel if these were your wife and your children. Frank, as with many other men and women, have seen things which you and I will never see or comprehend. And to watch him as he recalled these moments and to see the tears in his eyes made me realise how painful it is for those who willingly put their life on the line. Frank was about 82 years old when he shared these things, some 50 or 60 years after the events Yet he still told me that on occasions he would still get nightmares and he still found it hard to talk about. You were all very brave, I said. No. Being brave had nothing to do with it, he said. You just got on with the job. Just like Frank, our service men and women may not see themselves as heroic or brave, but what they are and what each of them show is commitment. Commitment to each other and to the task in hand. They show loyalty to their fellow men and to their country. They give sacrifice in the sense that they are prepared to die to enable others to live in freedom. And through all that, they give hope. Hope to the people they are fighting to protect so that they can look forward to a new future that will bring them peace and security. Even though I don't fully understand what Remembrance Sunday represents, I am moved by what I see through the lives of those who have witnessed it 
experienced it and felt it. Just as I am moved by what I read to the witness of those in God's word who talks about a man who was committed, loyal and sacrificial in the giving of himself so that both you and I can have a hope for a new and better future. His name is Jesus, the Son of the living God. Jesus was committed to the task set before him by his Father, and that task was to save each one of us from the destruction that sin has upon our lives. He wants to take us from the clutches of the evil that infiltrates us and controls us and the ultimate death that is the the consequence of this sin. And in its place, he offers us a life of freedom through him. In John 10.10, it says, The thief, the devil, comes only to steal and kill and destroy But I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus was not only committed to the task, but also to those around him. No matter what people said about him or did to him, he never stopped loving them. Jesus never stops loving you and I either. And he will continue to fight your corner and continue to speak to your heart because you are precious and special to him. Do you know how worthy you are in the eyes of Jesus? He came to go all the way by giving his life for you and for me. Jesus was also loyal to his father In the Garden of Gethsemane, before his arrest, Jesus prayed that, if possible, that the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible to you. Take this cup from me, yet not that I will, but what you will. A prayer of a frightened man, perhaps. Remember that Jesus was fully human, although purely divine. How would you and I feel if we were staring death in the face? Jesus knew what he had to do, and he knew it was his Father's will that he had to make the journey to the cross, for he knew it was for our salvation. Do we really know what it cost Jesus to set us free? Jesus never put himself first. He always thought of others before himself, and he continues to do so. Jesus' commitment and loyalty led him to a cross, and there, having been whipped and beaten almost beyond recognition, He willingly gave up his life for you and me. It was our sin which nailed him to the cross, and it was for our sin that his blood was shed. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. The death of Jesus enables each one of us to have a new life, a new beginning through him. We don't have to suffer because Christ did that for us. We only need to come before the cross, repent of our sin and invite us into our lives. If we are sincere in doing this, our lives will be transformed by his spirit who lives or abides within us. And we may have life in all its fullness, just as Jesus promised. A life of joy and a life of peace. Not because we won't face difficulties, because that will always be a part of our lives. Just as they were for Jesus when he was here on earth. But we will get it because in and through those difficulties, Christ promises 
that he will never leave us or forsake us. Christ put his life on the line for you and me. He gave his all. Are we prepared to give our life back to him, to give him our all? We have nothing to lose, but we have everything to gain. And what is the outcome of giving our life to Christ? What is the purpose? In 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, it gives us the answer. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Christ's death and his resurrection has given us the opportunity of eternal life and a hope that one day we will be with him forever. As we read in Revelation, there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. We all have this hope available to us because one man was willing to fight our corner, put his life on the line, not for any gain for himself, but purely for our salvation, our freedom, and our hope of eternity with him. There was a soldier who, having been injured in combat, lay in a field amongst the dirt and the dross, knowing that if he didn't get help soon, he would be sure to die. Out of nowhere came four of his comrades who helped him to safety and enabled him to get the treatment that he needed. The soldier gradually recovered, and as he lay in his hospital bed, he realised that if it wasn't for the four men who had put their lives at risk to save him, he would never have been alive at that moment, if only he knew who they were. As the day of his release from hospital neared, a young man came in to see him. He was one of the soldiers who saved him. Looking up at the young man, the soldier reached out his hand. Thank you, he said, for giving me back my life. Through the dirt and the dross of the sin in our lives, may we realise that we have been saved because of what Christ has done for us. And may we too reach out our hand and say to him, Thank you, Jesus for giving me back my life. Amen.